In, 19, in 1798, an English economist named Thomas Malthus wrote his famous essay on the principle of population. In it, Malthus claimed that the population grew exponentially, while resources needed to feed this population grew at a linear rate. The difference between the two, he argued, must lead to starvation. Well, Malthus was wrong, and not by little, by a lot. Moving forward, 1968, Paul Ehrlich published the book, The Population Bomb, arguing basically the same thing. The book warns of the catastrophic consequences of overpopulation, including food shortage, resource depletion, environmental degradation, and social collapse. It became an international bestseller and had a significant impact on the public discourse on this very subject. My guest today, think both Malthus and Ehrlich are profoundly wrong. His name is Marianne Tupi and he is a co-author, along with Gail Pooley, of the new and terrific book, Super Abundance, the story of population growth, innovation, and human flourishing on an infinitely bountiful planet. Beside this, Marianne Tupi is the editor of Human humanprogress.org, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, and the co-author of the Simon Abundance Index. He specializes in globalization and global well-being, and the politics and economies of Europe and South Africa. He is also the co-author of 10 Global Trends Every Smart Person Should Know. Hi, Marianne, and thank you so much for coming. How are you today? Shalom. I'm very well. Nice to be with you. Shalom. Have you ever been in Israel? I haven't. I would love to go. Next time you visit, please give me a call. I will give you a wonderful tour, and which is exactly the place to say hi and welcome to my channel. My name is Roy Yosevic. In this channel, I speak and converse with the most influential and interesting young people from all around the world discussing science, philosophy, human prosperity, and artificial intelligence. If you love this talk, please consider subscribing, hit the bell button, and be part of this great community. Now, let's start. You had a, you made a wonderful book. You and, Gay, uh, and, and your co-author made a wonderful, this is a, well, it's a heavy tome full with anecdotes, full with stories, full with fascinating facts, but it is, has very big disadvantage, very big flaw. It is too positive. And you know, as Paul Ehrlich knows, that negative books sell more. What are you going to do about this? <laughs> I don't think that any, anything can be done about it. Um, I think that human beings evolved to be uh, pessimistic or negative or pay attention to uh, bad things. Uh, there is a reason why in the journalism profession, they talk about if it bleeds, it leads. What, it's, what it means is that if you want to sell newspapers or if you want to keep the attention of the viewer um, during the news news hour or whatever, um, you have to lead with bad stories. People are simply much less interested about the fact that 99% of Israelis go to bed safe and sound, healthy and prosperous. The, the, you know, your, your, your newscast, just as ours here in the United States, will focus on that one terrorist outrage or, uh, you know, that one catastrophe that takes place in, impacts few people. That, that basically, we have evolved to focus on the negative. And as a result of that, people who publish books about the world ending are going to sell many more copies about th than, than people who uh, basically claim that uh, there's every chance that we are going to be fine. Uh, I, I don't think anything can be done with that. You know, I can say that your book warns against not overpopulation, but underpopulation. But we will get to that uh, in a minute. Now, first question, both Ehrlich and Malthus were wrong. But it seems that there is a huge difference because one can say that Ehrlich is 170 years smarter. He saw what Malthus said, and he saw that it turned out to be a completely false. And my question is, what did Ehrlich, according to your opinion, knew or knows that Malthus didn't know? 
Um, I think that what was uh, really influential for Ehrlich uh, was the tremendous increase in population in uh, what we used to call third world countries or the developing world after the Second World War. So uh, Malthus in his little world in England already saw that population was increasing and he was deeply worried about it. But after the end of the Second World War, when you have Western medicine and best practices basically spreading around the world, um, you have massive population growth in places like India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, China, uh, elsewhere. And Paul Ehrlich is looking at the world in 1960s. And what, what I think he sees is that is that the, the, the population growth was, was even faster than what Malthus, uh, Malthus saw. And that really spooked him. As he said in his book, um, he really got this idea in India, um, and and he just didn't see how India could survive uh, with that many people. Well, of course, at the time when Paul Ehrlich was in India, India had half a billion people. Today, India has one and a half billion people, and those Indians haven't starved. India today is a food exporter. I just want to repeat that for your listeners. India today is a food exporter. So, so between 1968 and today, Indian population has tripled, basically, um, and instead of starving, they are food exporters. So, so I think that 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 was the key: is that um, uh, it was that population boom in the uh, in the post World War era um, that really spooked Ehrlich. Um, but, but uh, fundamentally, he was wrong. Yes. Just a second. When you say that India is, is a food exporter, you say that food coming out. In ships out of India to feed a uh, other countries but it doesn't mean that all 1.5 or 1.3 billion people go to bed every night a uh, full or, or, or not yes, I, so that, so that, we need to make point. this is a very clear this is a very important distinction that India can export however we The government there, you know, uh, the cost, there's a different cost. Many, many things can cause India to both export and have many, many hungry people, millions of hungry children going to sleep hungry every night. I would, I would qualify that. I would, I would rephrase that. Uh, India, a lot of people in India suffer from food insecurity. Um, which really means that maybe instead of three meals a day, they have two meals a day or maybe even one meal a day. That is not an uncommon uh, situation in developing countries. What India doesn't have, which it used to have as long as the historical record is long, uh, what India doesn't have is famines, uh, meaning uh, tens of millions of people no longer die because... there is simply no food. Now it is true that if you are an Indian farmer, uh, you may decide to sell your produce, like rice, for example, uh, to the rest of the world, um, thereby uh, but but that wouldn't have a necessarily an impact on uh, on on the people who who earn very little in India because whether there is food or not, if you are not earning any money, you are going to starve anyway, right? Uh, so so the, 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 that's the that's the important uh, caveat there is that even though there are still food insecure people, famines have disappeared from India. Nobody's suggesting that uh, there are no longer hungry people in the world. Nobody's suggesting that there are no longer poor people in the world. But the kind of mass starvation that was predicted by Malthus and Ehrlich simply didn't happen. Quite the opposite. Uh, calories consumed per person in India are increasing just like anywhere else in the world, including in Africa. Now, I... I, I want to quote from your book and again Malthus lived in a very different age before the Industrial Revolution and Ehrlich lived after the Industrial Revolution after World War one World War two so in a way Ehrlich is much more interesting or much more to blame than Malthus Malthus just didn't know he didn't know but you said uh, but you uh, write in your book about Ehrlich the following thing. Ehrlich's background in biology is relevant. In the non-human animal world, and this is a very important non-human animal world, a sudden increase in the availability of resources leads to population explosion, which lead to the exaggeration of resources and population collapse. So if I'm a biologist and I look at the petri dish, I say, yeah, basically things go 
if there is a increase sudden increase in population inevitably inevitably there will be a population collapse what he didn't understand according to your theory is that the non-human animal world is profoundly different than the human world am i right that's right um animals uh, generally don't uh trade and they don't innovate yes it is possible for some species to trade um, but they don't trade across time and in different items nobody has ever seen two animals basically deciding okay today you are going to give me a bone <laughs> and two weeks later i'm going to give you a, a dead rabbit uh things like that don't happen so so animals cannot trade they cannot but but also animals don't innovate generally uh, we do have some species that, for example, there's a, a special crow that will take a piece of burning wood and then, uh, uh, you know, then drop it uh, in a field to 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 get um, um, to get the animals scared like rabbits and and goes and and catches the rabbits or or vermin or whatever. But uh, as a general rule, that is the extent of of animal innovation. Uh, something as simple. This was something that blew me away when I was researching for this book. Something as simple as female chimpanzees teaching their children how to crack a nut. It can take up to eight years, you know. So, so animals don't innovate, and we do. Basically, we do. And 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 the more of us, the the better we innovate. I mean, the point is the point of the book is that um, uh, the more people you have, the more ideas you have, and those new ideas lead to new innovations which increase productivity and therefore standards of living. So put simply, um, what differentiates our standard of living from that of people in the Stone Age is not natural resources, but new knowledge or new innovation. Let me repeat that. The world today has as much natural resources as it did 500,000 years ago or 300,000 years ago. Uh, aside from a few tons of steel that we have blown out into the space, everything everything that the Stone Age people had, we have. And the difference between their standards of living and ours is new knowledge or innovation. That's all. And And again, one can say exactly the same thing about Africa. Africa is not poor with resources. It is poor with proper management or proper government. And, but we will come to Africa later on. You give an, an ex, a great example about sea level that, you know, we may, uh, you know, uh, floods and the sea level goes up and up. And you say, we treat this as people, we just sit there as the water coming <laughs> up and up and up. But yeah. there is nothing more farther from the truth. And the Dutch 300 years ago, Could you please tell the story? I, I want to tell it exactly. Well, well, look, I mean, obviously, I'm a believer in human ingenuity. I'm a believer in uh, uh, basically in the idea that things will work out if we have in spite of having more people. In fact, I believe that people are important uh, for for economic growth and general prosperity. And so very often I will get this question. But what about the environmental effects? And there are some uh, and people will invariably bring up uh, rise in uh, in 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 sea levels now sea levels do not seem to be the, the the increase in sea levels doesn't seem to be accelerating and it seems to be differing somewhat in different parts of the world but the bottom line is that we are looking probably at one foot uh per century one foot per century and 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 so people talk about it as though we are just going to stand in place for For hundreds or even thousands of years <laughs> let the sea level increase until we are going to drown but that's not how human beings operate uh, when we see a problem when it becomes a problem uh, then we are going to address it we are either going to adapt uh, or we are going to address it in some other way so adaptation again uh, only humans really adapt on a conscious level is a perfect example uh, the dutch 300 years ago decided that They wanted more land and to be secure from from the ocean and so one third of holland today is below the sea level uh, it's areas which are dried and then they build barriers 
on uh, you know on on uh, on the coasts uh, to keep the sea from enveloping Holland. And Holland is obviously a very safe and very prosperous society. And they did that. The Dutch did that. All this marvel of engineering hundreds of years ago when their technology was very primitive and when their GDP per capita was maybe the same level as Bangladesh today. So there's absolutely no reason why we cannot repeat that in other parts of the world today, including poor parts of the world. You know, there is a great joke about God uh, calling you as the chief rabbi of Israel and the chief rabbi of Judaism and the Pope and the chief uh, uh, rabbi of a uh, Muslim. I don't know how, how they call Mufti. it. Yeah, and, and, and the chief Mufti and say, listen, I'm going to extend the world. is going to be flooded again in one month. And the Pope comes back to Rome and say, listen, we need to pray. And the Mufti come back to Mecca and say, we need to pray. And the chief rabbi come back to Israel and say, listen, we need, we have one month. We need to learn how to live underwater. So <laughs> this is basically people adapt. Yes. People adapt no matter what happens. Uh, same, goes, same goes for temperature, basically. I mean, uh, do I think the world is warming? Yes, uh, I accept that. But you know, uh, what matters really is the infrastructure for human survival. If you wake up in the morning in Canada in the middle of December or January, and it's minus 20 degrees Celsius, and you hop on a plane, you can be down in the Caribbean where it's, where it's 30 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, in, in four or five hours. So the difference uh, in temperature will be, what, 50 degrees Celsius. Um, and yet the human being is capable of living in both extremes. Uh, that's because the infrastructure around him or her has been created to suit his, uh, to, to allow him to exist. And temperature is not the main, is not the only parameter that interests us. For, for example, humidity plays even a bigger role, most significant role about our feeling about tem about temperature. So I, I I totally agree. But let me ask you one thing: there is like the Simon Ehrlich bet. So if you could please elaborate on this bet, and then I want to ask you about the logical consequences of this bet, because people usually bring this bet, and I had a. a Thomas Sowell in basic economics bring this bet as a proof too. And my question is, is this Simon Ehrlich bet proof to what? But before we go to the proof of what, what is the Simon uh, Ehrlich bet or so wager? Ehrlich, Ehrlich came up with that book, uh, Population Bomb, and it became extremely, um, extremely popular. And uh, Julian Simon, uh, who was an economist at University of Maryland and also a senior fellow at the Cato Institute where I work, he basically looked at the numbers and didn't make any sense to him. And so he asked Ehrlich if he would want to debate him. And Ehrlich said, no, I won't debate you. You are nobody. What do I care? So then uh, basically Simon said, okay, then I'm challenging you to a bet. Choose any five commodities and any period of time longer than one year. And let's see what happens. If the population increases, and the price of these commodities increases, then you win and I'll pay you. But if the population increases and the prices of these resources decline, then you have to pay me. And so the bet was, uh, the, the commodities were chosen by Ehrlich, not by Simon, but by Ehrlich for tungsten, tin, zinc, copper. Copper and, and chromium, else. yes. And, and, uh, and for 10 years. And it was for 10 years between 1980 and 1990. And uh, when the wager expired, uh, basically, these commodities became 36% cheaper in spite of the world adding something like 600 million people, you know, in terms of population. And so Simon won. And uh, yeah, that's that's the story. Now, what are the logical implications? The logical implications are that human beings are not just consumers. They're not just destroyers or, or consumers or destroyers. They're also creators. In other words, it's possible to create uh, ever more. It's possible to create more resources. It's possible to save resources. It's possible to substitute resources, and it's also possible to get ever more value out of resources that we have. Um, so, so yeah, let maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Okay. So, the the idea is 
if you let enough people enough time and enough incentives and this is crucial and we will come uh, to incentives later on if you give them enough time enough resources enough incentives they will come up with a better more efficient way to produce copper to produce I, I don't know cotton to produce wheat to produce everything okay All right. I All right. and, and but maybe not usually well, sometimes you It worked great for Simon, but we don't know for sure. And again, I, I, I am on your side on this no, debate. No, I I'm understand. On, I, I'm, understand. I am on Simon's side on this debate. But it, it, what Simon proved that for those five commodities, and you, you know, it can be for all commodities from 1917 to 1988, I think it worked great. But can we promise, can we ensure that As humanity that we will always be able to come up with new ways to get out more resources in less money well let's no. let let's look at a couple of things here one is uh, that precisely because of that time limitation of the bet uh, we took the bet in our book uh, super abundance uh, we did it for hundred and 80 years was it uh 178 years right so so in other words we massively extended the the time frame and also instead of five commodities we have hundreds of different commodities food uh, fuel metals minerals even some services and everything has become cheaper so so in other words light that... artificial light you blew my mind you just blew my mind I, 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 I must put this data because what it just blew my mind one of hour of artificial light in in 1850 cost approximately three work hours again one hour of artificial light in 1850s cost approximately three work hours today it costs approximately 0.15 seconds of Oh, it's, it's it's uh it's probably even less than that uh th- this this is a statistic that came from uh, the work of the Nobel Prize in economist uh Nordhaus uh we use that uh as uh, to to show that other people are thinking like us uh, but of course we we add m- many more examples like that um so so the first thing to to understand is that um you Obviously, we do this over a much longer period of time, over many, many different uh, resources, and they're all becoming cheaper. In spite of the fact that in the last 200 years, the world's population has increased from 1 billion to 8 billion. That's important. So the world has, you know, uh, eight times as many people, but things are cheaper. So what the hell is going on? And secondly, we have never run out of anything. Uh, this is the key, is that all those people who are saying we are going to eventually run out of something... need to at least point to one thing in the past that we have run out of the dodo uh, <laughs> the, the dodo. dodo the dodo right so so yes uh, we we have managed to kill some species off uh, now of course species are created by natural evolution and they die off due to normal um, natural causes all the time I mean there's a there's a what it's called the background level of the species depletion in other words uh, on on daily basis there is there are species of something that die uh, that have nothing to do with human beings it just happens because nature is cruel animals eat each other you know um, uh, or, or or you know or they run out of resources um, so 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 we have never run out of anything and there's a lot of ways in which that can happen I mean a perfect example of that would be if price of something increases, Then of course you have an incentive to look for additional deposits we have more deposits of oil and gas than we did a hundred years ago in spite of um in spite of using it to power civilization we have more resource more reserves uh, that we know of because of course once the price goes up you have more of an incentive to look for it in order to make a profit but that's not just the only way it's not just that we uh, And, and we really know only of a fraction of what's on the planet. We have no idea what's 10 kilometers beneath the ground or whatever. And as our technology improves, we'll be able to dig deeper and so on. But now let's assume that at some point there is going to be a limit, right? You can only deep so you can only dig so deep and so. On. So hypothetically, it's possible that at some point we run out of things to mine. Well, yes, but 
you, what you can also do is to substitute one thing for another. Uh, so for example, uh, we used guano deposits, which is basically bird poop, uh, in order to increase agricultural productivity, in order to fertilize our fields, because guano is filled with potassium and nitrogen and hydrogen. And um, when the price of that started to increase in the mid-1800s, uh, the German uh, scientists, uh, Haber and Bush, came up with uh, artificial uh, fertilizer, which now we make out of natural gas, right? So, so that, that, that would be called substitution. Another way in which you, we can get more resources is by uh, efficiency gains or, or saving. So for example, 10 years ago, if you walked into any hotel room anywhere in the world, you would see a big blue cable that ran from the wall to your computer. Because if you wanted to log into your computer to get, to get internet, <laughs> it had to be done through a copper cable. Uh, running from your computer to the wall, those uh, have disappeared. Why? Because anytime you go to a hotel, you just do Wi-Fi. You, you do it over airwaves. So that's a perfect example how actually something that seemed absolutely necessary just com becomes completely obsolete. And that's a lot of saving. Um, and who knows what the future holds? Uh, maybe all of our uh, machines will be powered uh, without the need for copper wires or any kind of wires. Maybe wires will become something of the past because all energy and information will be passed through the air. So, uh, you know, all we need is new knowledge. Whatever problem there is, all we need is new knowledge, as uh, David Deutsch from Oxford likes to say. You know, in the recent uh, conversations, I think that you had with Mike Shermer, your co-author, Gay Pooley, said uh, about how rich we are that he offered his student money to never use their iPhone again. And he said he never got to manage any student to give up his iPhone for less than $5 million, Correct. which means that all the students in his class are $5 million rich because it's yes. not what you have, it, what, it, it is what you are willing to sacrifice, okay? Which leads me to three, uh, uh, three notions that we need to distinguish in order to understand how lucky we are. One is the real price, B is the nominal price, and C is the time price. And I think you know that people say, yeah, people, you know, ignore what, what adjust for, for inflation is and just look at the, at the real price and not how much they have in the wallet and not on the time price, which again, this is mind blowing. Again, the, the, the 0 0.15 uh, seconds for one hour of artificial light. So if you can distinguish between the nominal price, real price and time price. Sure. Uh, nominal price is what you see in the store every day. If you go and buy a loaf of bread or uh, something like that, um you you that's that's what on the shelf but we know uh, that that that's insufficient uh, to look over time Th those prices change all the time right so to get a sense whether you are really better off now as opposed to 10 years ago uh, you have to adjust for inflation right and uh most people understand intuitively that um uh, the real price is basically nominal price minus the rate of inflation over time um, but the problem with nominal price and real price is that they don't take into account what is happening in your wallet, right? So people become more productive over lifetime. And uh, as a species, we are much more productive than our ancestors were, but we also become much more productive over lifetime. So let's say that you are a man in your thirties or forties. So when you were a little boy, maybe you delivered newspapers and somebody paid you a dollar an hour. But now you're making 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 dollars an hour. So that matters, right? So whenever you hear a an old person say, Oh, well, when I was a young man, you know, a liter of milk cost two shekels. I have no idea what prices in Israel are. <laughs> Very good. Okay. And 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 today it's 10 shekels. It's horrible, right? But you have to ask that person, okay, but how much were you making back then? as opposed to how much you are making now, okay? Because, because, inflation, uh, because inflation 
uh, is seen both in terms of prices, but also in wages. I mean, basically, um, a typical American worker, a manufacturing worker in 1980 was earning maybe $6 an hour. But today, it's like $27 or $28 an hour. This is a person in, in blue-collar work making cars, right? And that matters because if you are dividing two shekels by six shekels, and then you are dividing 10 shekels by 30 shekels, it gives you a completely different sense of how, how expensive or how cheap things are. And so time price, the beauty of time price is it takes into account both the price, but also how much you are weight, how much, how much you are earning. And once you start thinking not in terms of dollars or shekels, but once you start thinking in terms of minutes and hours of work, then you suddenly start saying that things are much better than, 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 than people assume. And it's a great disservice to the people around the world is that newspapers generally don't understand the difference between the three prices. When they talk about prices being the highest ever, it's because they are looking at nominal prices, right? They are not even adjusting for inflation. Mm. Once they adjust for inflation, the picture is much better. Once they take into account the increase in wages, because we are much more productive, then things are much better. And as we document in the book, uh, Americans are just incredibly rich uh, in terms of in terms of time prices. Yes, you, you know, preparing this conversation, I called my cousin. He's in the real estate business, and I asked him, "Okay, now one way to measure it is to measure how many salaries, how many months do you need to work in order to get an apartment in Israel?" Okay, mm -hmm. so this is basically in time hour. Okay, how many salaries? And the number of salaries has increased over time in Israel. Now, this is just because Israel is the city on the hill and this is a strange, or this phenomena is also occurring in the US. Because again, in Israel, the number of salaries that you need in order to buy an apartment has increased over the years. Now, it, it increased way uh, above level in Tel Aviv, but it also increased in other in other cities as well. Mm -hmm. So um, that's an excellent point. In the United States, uh, the the time price of housing is lower now than what it was, say, um, fifty years ago. Uh, very few people understand that. That's because what we are focusing on when we talk about prices of housing in the United States is very popular metropolitan areas. Our um, equivalent of Tel Aviv, which would be New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, places like that. Um, and But when you look at the average price of a house in the United States, it is cheaper relative to income today than it was 50 years ago. Um, the other thing that you need to do when looking at housing and I would love to talk to your cousin about it, or maybe your cousin can do this uh, himself. So what you need to figure out is what is the average price of a house in Israel, as opposed to 50 years ago? What is the square footage of the house today, as opposed to 50 years ago? Because in America, our houses are much bigger than what they were in 1970s. And also, what is the number of people who live in the house? Uh, as the family size has shrunk, people have much more space than they used to. And finally, what you have to take into account is the interest rate. So um, if you are buying a house on a 30-year mortgage, for example, and interest rates in the 70s were 13%, but until COVID in the United States, they were like 3%, right? So that also um, influences uh, in terms of what is the premium that you have to work for, how many hours you have to spend in order to pay the premium for the housing. Housing, is, in other words, housing is complicated. But it can be done. And, and again, I, I, I must tell you, you are absolutely right, because I know for for a fact that newborn cabin, you know, to store all, all these like small shirts and small pants used to be in Israel 80 centimeters width. And then uh, 10 years ago, it became one meter width. And then the standard became 120 width. So we, again... With time, we consume more. So the average just become bigger. And this is you a great have point. To adjust, you have to adjust for all of those things. Now, it can be done. It's just difficult. In, in the book, we do talk about American housing, and we show the numbers. Everything is completely transparent. 
And what we find is that housing is actually a little bit cheaper. It's it's not as cheap as food and whatever, but it is cheaper. Now, um, there, there are other problems when you, once once you start thinking about housing, healthcare, education, and that sort of thing. And one is monopoly, monopsony, uh, things like um, things like nimbyism, the fact that you actually cannot build housing, much housing in the United States in these metropolitan areas. In Washington, D.C., where I live, you've got a height constraint on how tall the buildings can be. If we didn't have those height constraints, we could have high risers all over the city and the prices of uh, housing would drop because there would be a lot more supply. Yeah. But the supply is artificially restricted by the government. So, so that's another thing. Therefore, a, a much better way of, or much, much simpler way of getting a sense of how well people are is to compare... Um, is to compare those areas of the economy where the market is allowed to function properly, such as, for example, production of food. And once you look at that, um, it's it's extraordinary. Um, you know, a, a typical American worker. Hold on, let's, do, do I have time to 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 look? Give for, give uh, me give me the give me the uh, the page. Give me the page. Okay, I've, uh, okay, I've got. Okay, so let's go to. Uh, let's let's do food prices uh, because I think that will be very interesting for for your viewers. Let's go to page one sixty six. One sixty six. Can you pull it up on the screen, or is that not just possible? A, yeah, yeah. Just a second. Give me a second. One sixty six. Just a second. I think. Oh, just a second. Where is where is the page? Just a second. No worries. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. I I share you and you tell me uh, how far am I? Uh, okay. Okay. This is... I don't see the page because there I we see... Go. There, uh, no, 160. Oh, I see. Uh, I don't know what you have there. Oh, hold on. Go. I'll go up. Okay. Just a second. Go up. Okay. Uh, just give me like the first. Give me the first. Okay, I'm, I'm looking for figure five point nineteen. Figure five point nineteen. Oh. Oh, this is. Figure oh, there four. we go. There we go. Fantastic. You, you see the. <laughs> this is great. Okay. So for your listeners, what we are looking at here, is, food prices in the United States or time prices of food. From a blue collar perspective, meaning somebody in the manufacturing sector, sector making cars, uh, uh, over a hundred year period between 1990 and 2019. So as you can see, the time price of eggs, meaning the amount of time that you have to work in order to buy eggs in the United States, has fallen by 97%. Which, which means mean that, yeah, one, which... Uh, uh, that one container of egg one you for the same money one now you can uh, buy 20 uh, 26 containers 36 36 36 i'm sorry 36 so for the same amount of work that would get you one egg or one dozen eggs you now get 36 eggs today so your abundance has increased by 35 by a factor of 35 or 3500 percent right um hence sugar right? sugar um uh, ham i don't sugar. think that would be very popular yeah either. we don't <laughs> eat them we don't know this is a kosher podcast that's right for kosher podcast but so on average uh, uh on average food prices in the united states have fallen by 91 percent which means that now you can get 11 items for the same Marianne. amount of work. yeah do you have like an intuitive explanation why some commodities for for example like eggs and sugars and ham uh, are extremely high in this ratio and some are extremely low do you well, have like uh, this intuitive ex explanation uh, i don't i don't we didn't look into we, we didn't look into that and it would be wrong for me to speculate so Okay, so with uh, uh, with your permission, can we move on to the harder sure. questions? Sure. Okay, if I understand your argument, it is not for more people, but for more people in an open society, free market, where people have incentive to invent 
a society that motivate entrepreneurs. This is basically what you what you're saying. And what's your case for more population in a uh, non-open societies? Like China, uh, you mentioned the story of uh, Steve Jobs that his father, his uh, biological father, was born in Syria, and said, "What happened? What would have happened if Steve Jobs would stay in Syria? The history would have looked otherwise. But now we have other Steve Jobs in Syria that we don't that they don't live in Silicon Valley. Do you have any argument for more people in non-open societies? Well, uh, I, I I never thought about it that way. I mean, the, the point I was making is that obviously population is important because people produce ideas which lead to innovations. Mm. But it cannot be the only story because if population was all that mattered, then China would have been the world's richest country always. China has been the most populous country in the world for 2,000 years. Mm. But until recently, they were dirt poor. And it was only after China started to liberalize in the late 1970s that um, it became more open, that you had this sudden huge explosion in um, in wealth creation. I would make, if I may, I hope this is not too controversial, but I would make the same point about Israel. Um, you know, the, you have the same Israelis today that you had in the 1960s and 1970s and 1980s, but Israel was an economic basket case until the 90s. And then suddenly you had this massive explosion in wealth creation, prosperity and economic growth. Why? Because you had economic reforms beginning in the 90s that have uh, that have allowed Israelis to implement their God-given talents in a much more open risk-taking fashion. Um, you so know, I, I, this is due to Milton Friedman. When Milton Friedman got his uh, honorary doctorate from the Hebrew University, he said the following sentence, never in the course of history a nation uh, gained more from capitalism and free market like the Jews, and never in the course of history a nation did so much to to break capitalism and free market like the Jews. Okay, so yes, well, I know. It's, it's a funny thing. Uh, Jews tend to be overrepresented both in terms of hating capitalism, but also loving capitalism. Whether it is uh, Ayn Rand, uh, who I believe was Jewish, or whether it is Milton Friedman. So you have a lot of Jewish defenders of capitalism. But of course, on the other hand, you've got people like Karl Marx and uh, uh, you know people like that. But anyway, the bottom line is that um, more people is good, uh, but only within the uh, free framework. Uh, if you don't have freedom, um, the ability to speak, the ability to associate, to try new things, to profit from your inventions, then um, then you are then you can be stuck in poverty. So it's really people times freedom equals superabundance. Freedom is very important. And, and again, uh, you 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 tell the story about the Supreme Court in Hong Kong and why Hong Kong is so profoundly different from China. People love to invest in Hong Kong, or at least love to invest in Hong Kong. But now, you know, Hong Kong wants to pursue humanity or the restaurant uh, civil, uh, civilization that it is different from China. And what they did is to uh, get supreme to get British. Uh, uh, for the Supreme Court and say, listen, we are uh, we are l- close to China, but if something goes wrong, these are the people who are going to uh, make order, to make justice. And we count on the British and we count on the tradition of the British Empire to make, yes, this will be fine. But again, this is, a, you need to be very mature to take over, to let go of your national pride and say, okay, I get outsiders as Supreme Court and many nations don't do it. Therefore, we have such a profound problems in Africa that it seems that no one can say, no one can solve. Yeah, so there's a high correlation between democracy and openness, but but you don't actually have to have democracy in order to generate a lot of economic growth, you can still have open society without necessarily a democracy. Hong Kong is a perfect example. Hong Kong was never a democracy, but it was a uh, but it was an open society with rule of law, 
uh, and with a lot of civic uh, civil liberties. So so uh, people couldn't vote, but but the system was set up in such a way that it was a very open. You, you could you could undertake any business you wanted. You could publish anything in the newspapers you wanted. You could say anything you wanted. You just couldn't vote because it was a colony. Um, so uh, so as a, but as a general rule. Uh, democracies tend to be more open than uh, dictatorships, and um, um, so so the freedom is important, um, and and so is um, and so is the ability of of uh, people. Um, the whole look right now, the world relies on uh, on on the developed West, uh, where I include Israel, in order to produce the innovations that then spread out to the rest of the world. So the whole world benefits because there are small parts of the world, Western Europe, Northern America, Israel, where you have a lot of innovation. Imagine what would happen if Africa, Latin America, um, um, uh, huge parts of Asia uh, suddenly became really a hardcore part of the global economy. If people there had uh, access to the rule of law and property rights and 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 free press and so on and so forth, uh, obviously, uh, an opportunity. So the, 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 I'm sure there are a lot of Steve Jobses in, in Africa and Latin America and elsewhere who are never going to get a chance to benefit humanity because they, they are stuck in a horrible place. Part of the reason why, you know, uh, some form of immigration, uh, hopefully a well-regulated immigration is actually quite beneficial. America is certainly benefiting from a lot of uh, immigration from the rest of the world. Yeah. We there is a book called Mind Hive, which based were uh, written by Gary Jones, and he said that the nation average IQ is much more important than your own IQ. And in in this book, he argued that there is a negative correlation between the average nation IQ and the level of corruption. And it at and according to Gary Jones, it had it has nothing nothing to do with moral values. The idea is that being corrupted as a government is inefficient, is non-efficient. If you want to make things progress, corruption and pride and you know and, and all those things uh, hold the state back. And my question is, you almost never mentioned the word intelligence in your book, but what's your take on this on on maybe the average, nation's IQ is a, is a, is a huge factor in superabundance and prosperity and and uh, just a second and innovation in human flourishing well I don't uh, I don't I'm not familiar with that literature and I don't have the data for the world now if I knew that there was good enough data for the whole world uh you know intelligence that was representative of, the, of different nations then i'd be quite interested in that kind of literature but i don't know if that data exists um and i don't uh, as i said i'm not familiar with that now mm. the reason why we don't do that is because um is because it, it it's sort of implied in our work that that people who are innovators will have a certain number of attributes. Intelligence may be one of them, but let, let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, it's not true that everybody innovates. There seems to be a small group of people in any country, somewhere between, I don't know, somewhere around five or 6% who innovate, okay? So, so we have a stable share of the population that innovates. Um, I believe that in the book we we have data for Israel, but I'm not I'm not sure now. I would have to look at it. But the, but the point is, it's as it's not as though it's not as though twenty percent of people innovate or thirty percent of people innovate. It's a, it's a small fraction of the population, and and so obviously, if you have a population of the world of three hundred million, like was at the time of the Caesar Augustus. Um, or that Jewish rebel, Jesus Christ, <laughs> 300 million <laughs> people in the world, right? Then the share of the people who are going to innovate is going to be much smaller. Uh, sorry, the absolute number of people who are going to yes. innovate is going to be much smaller than if you have a population of 8 billion. And so that it, it, it's stable. And now the question is, can you really, we don't know how to increase that number. 
a um, lot of money around the world is being spent by government trying to increase innovation, but it's not doesn't seem to be working that way. And the theory that we produce in the book is that actually, yes, intelligence is implied, but but it's it's people with with very strange sense of personal attributes. They seem to be predominantly antisocial. Okay, <laughs> so let's explore this a little bit. The story of human prosperity is actually a social one. Um, we benefit as a species. We grow as a species. We become wealthy by cooperating. Me and you cooperating. We are having this conversation over Zoom. That's a social interaction. Um, if I need it uh, like a monkey, somebody to scratch my back, I just ask the other person, can you scratch my back? <laughs> Innovators don't want to do that. Innovators don't necessarily want to interact with other human beings. They're not going to ask the other person to scratch my back. They're going to invent a gadget to do that because they prefer to... They, but basically, in spite of the fact that we are social species, we disproportionately account on antisocial people in order to you produce... You need misanthropic people in order to invent people, something. <laughs> This is right. great. People who hate asking other people for help are more likely to invent something that is going to move humanity forward. Now, is intelligence implied in that? Wow, I'm going to use this sentence Probably. so much in the next semester. This is great. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Uh, yeah, so 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 that's the that that's the working hypothesis is that. Um, Uh, it, it's a, it's it's people who have these personality attributes, and uh, is it, is it likely that many of them are highly intelligent? Yes, it is. Does it differ all that much across nations? I don't think so. I mean, I'd be astonished if, um, if Israelis uh, who have very high IQ had a much higher share of the population that innovates, uh, as opposed to you know a small share. So, you lived in South Africa for a quite for quite some time. And, well, uh, I, was, I was born in Europe, but I I grew up in Czechoslovakia and in South Africa, and then in Britain. Yes, and many people say, you know, I I just saw this uh, uh, Google Earth photos of the white neighborhood, and then a, a a road of six meters, and then the black neighborhood, and this is astonishing. The idea it, it, it's like you know Israel in Gaza, but you know there's just a a six meter road that separate Beverly Hills from from midtown India I I don't yeah. know so it, it, it the the idea that a, a human talent is not equally spreaded is a very very rough idea to digest nevertheless, Uh, it's like uh, Watson say that all the be- all the aiding pro- all the aiding programs that we give to Africa are based on the fact that okay it, this is just like Europe but then those aiding programs are failing again and again and again and again well, I mean, this I is a know. very controversial thing but it seems that we that we ignore it and maybe this is bad to ignore it. I don't know well uh, I mean uh, look uh, obviously there are there are different outcomes uh, between different groups of people um, Jews typically have been overachievers uh, that 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 is a well-established fact but I don't know to what extent we can say uh, w- we have no idea about how much human potential there really is in Latin America Asia Africa and other places in the world or, or Russia for that matter because they never were free. To really uh, to really apply whatever god-given talents they had uh, in order to benefit their own societies or the world right so um, um, Russia um, you know have they ever had a sensible government not really um, how many countries in Africa where you can say that people have the ability to apply their their, their talents maybe Botswana maybe Botswana Not very corrupt, pretty well run, decent rule of law, protection of private property. How many countries in Latin America? Chile? Chile. Pinochet, Maybe... Pinochet. 
Pino, uh, well, yeah. Pinochet started it, yeah. but but then yes. the other countries have followed. But I mean, you don't have uh, you have a very uh, dodgy uh, system of property rights and and good government in Argentina, uh, in Brazil, many other places. So so in 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 Latin America, really, Chile is the place. In uh, in in Asia and um, and the Pacific, well, you've got your Australia and New Zealand, very strong property rights. You've got Japan, um, Japan and Hong Kong, and yeah, yes, Hong- but Japan, you know, the uh, the made restoration. They wanted to become restaurants. The idea was it was a conscious a conscious effort of the nation to become more restaurant. Or, or, this or is least, what they wanted, or at least the, or, or at least the, the, the governing class. Yes. Um, uh, so, so my point is that one reason why I don't really get too heavy into the IQ debate and international comparisons is because I don't really know how much human potential is there. Okay, this is great. So let me take it from yeah. here to the next question, which is not IQ. This is education. And please tell yeah. me at the at the at the end of my question that I'm totally wrong. Please, okay. please, please. Richard Feynman once said that in order to do something meaningful in physics, you need to know a lot of things, mainly a uh, serious math. The idea of a new self-learning scientist like Michael Faraday or John Harrison, the self-educated English carpenter that invented the marine chronometer, just cannot happen anymore. You cannot just mix things in your kitchen and come up with a new element like uh, like Goodyear or uh, Marie Curie. Things don't work like this anymore. In order to do something meaningful in biology or chemistry or biochemistry, You need equipment that for most people, they don't have access to. So when you talk about the need for more people have the next big breakthrough, the next big breakthrough must be achieved on the shoulder of giants. And if you don't have this proper education, you can't come up with something new. So how about all the Asia and Russia with and, and all the... Uh, 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 All the places with great minds that they just don't have education or sufficient education to build on that something new and meaningful. Look, I don't tell you know, me you're completely I to, wrong. I, I don't want to overemphasize education. I really don't. I, I think we put too much emphasis on education. Uh, Um, what difference does it make if you have a high school or a university education if you are stuck in Lagos or Wagadugu and um, your passport is worth nothing you can't travel anywhere nobody wants you because they know that you would stay and in your home country uh, your education is completely pointless because you can't achieve anything because there is no rule of law there is no property rights if you manage to somehow create a business, Uh, the 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 general or the bureaucrat is going to take it away from you. Um, so you know I I don't think I, I think that high education levels are an outcome of economic development, not a prerequisite for economic development. They are an outcome of economic development. Um, I also am increasingly doubtful about much of what passes for education in the United States right now. I can still see the reason why you would want to go to school to learn physics or, Uh, chemistry or being a doctor uh, but much of our education is actually miseducating people um, so I think that that there is a tremendous amount of wastage that goes on in the higher education system um, um, so so I I, th- I think that education is uh, uh, very often overemphasized I also think that a lot of knowledge can be soaked up by people in the workplaces and Uh, the greatest engine behind economic development in a developing world is not necessarily education at home but education in the workplace uh, the the tacit knowledge which is passed on to you via multinational corporations that are embedded in your country so you have a corporation that opens a store or a factory um, and they bring with them a lot of tacit knowledge that they then give to the workers uh, workers there. So yeah, I guess I'm I'm in a funk mo- mood uh, mm-hmm. about the education system and uh, I think that uh, there are certain disciplines that you cannot avoid um, having to learn more uh, but um, 
I just don't think it's as important as as most people think. So maybe after all, your book is still pessimistic and it can, you know, be a bestseller because after uh, conversing with you for the last hour, I say, listen, I totally agree with everything that he just said, but I am very pessimistic about the possibility of non-Western, non-open society to change in order to enable this human flourishing to materialize. What can I do, okay? What can I do in Africa, in all, in all the co-opted nations in South America, in Asia? What can I do? Because, you know, uh, cultural changes sometimes are much more harder to achieve than biological changes. What can we do? Okay, you, I absolutely agree. I sign on everything that you just said. Can we change the culture of a society in order to make it more open? Can you actually see in your eyes that in China, the government will let people to say whatever they want? Um, I think I'm more optimistic than you are because, of course, in the last, um, in, in the last 100 years, we have seen uh, non-Western societies change track and prosper. Um, Chile is a good example of a Latin American country that has adopted um, whatever you want to call it maybe maybe let let's let's call it a, some sort of a package of uh, uh, Western ways of development the um, Chicago boys the, the, the ministry boys, yes. of yes yes so so uh, it we have seen it, we it have seen got it Western places. traits yeah we have seen it in other places uh, Botswana a country that I'm quite familiar with It's an African country. It is pretty well run, um, uh, you know, and has had very high rates of economic growth uh, until recently. Um, that's an African country. Uh, again, a, a relative success story. Um, we have countries uh, in uh, we have South Korea, we have um, uh, we have Taiwan. Uh, we had Hong Kong before it was subsumed into China. We have Singapore. Um, all of these countries have picked certain aspects of the of whatever you call it the, the the recipe for development that they have succeeded and let's not forget india india is a big deal india um for the first 30 years or so after independence or 40 years uh was a basket case and then they too have changed and they've changed within the democratic context so they didn't need pinochet to do that for them in 1991 they basically decided socialism doesn't work thank you very much Um, we are going to liberalize. Now, is India a free market paradise? It's not, but it is much uh, much freer than it used to be. They are democracy. They have freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Uh, they have rule of law. Um, and so... Property. The who, who, idea would thought, of... who would have thought, who would have thought in the 1960s or 1970s that India was going to be a, a success story? Uh, in fact, economists were obsessing about the Hindu rate of growth, right? That, that it was never going to grow. Now it's, uh, they thought the, the equilibrium in India was going to be like two or 3% forever. Well, it's 7%, okay? So, so does culture hold nations back? Yes. Can culture change? Yes. Um, it's difficult, but it can happen. Okay. Okay. Uh... Let us pray together. <laughs> okay, I want to be optimistic. I, 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 I truly want. Okay, last question. As an Orthodox Jew, uh, you, we know that there is a, a negative correlation between uh, the number of children that you have and your level of education. The birth index in all developed Western society are decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. In Japan, I think, is 1.5%. which means basically means that the population is just vanishing uh, uh, year after year in Korea, in, in Korea it's one it's 0.75 and 0.75 and in all Western educated countries we have basically the same thing I had a I had a conversation with Douglas Mary about the strangers of Europe basically the same thing the only exception that I know of is Israel correct. Which is not just orthodox uh, 
Orthodox uh, Jews, which produce much more uh, kids, but also secular Jews. The oh. number, the average number of for secular family in Israel is approximately three. And oh. what I have my own interpretation, but before I want, but but let's hear your interpretation to this very strange data. Um, the, the interpretation I have is what I've heard about is that Jews are simply much more optimistic about their future in Israel um, because the economy is doing well and the country is doing well. Uh, that's basically what I what I hear. Mm -hmm. But I cannot opine beyond that because I'm not a specialist. Uh, what, what I can tell you is that in my talks, I use Israel as a hope for the Western world because I say it is not unavoidable that people will have fewer babies. Look at Israel, where both secular and Orthodox Jews have many more babies than is necessary for replacement level. So that's very encouraging. And from what I hear from uh, people who know more about this stuff, it's because uh, th th there is more of a sense of optimism in Israel than than other places. But, but I would much rather prefer to hear from you what you have to say and uh, how you analyze the situation. Uh, so, oh, wow. Uh... Okay, one thing is that first I I really don't know. I think that I know, but I I I truly really don't know. I want to say that in the subconscious level, there is like a, even for secular Jews, we want to move on. We want to move on and we want to keep producing maybe after the Holocaust. And the Holocaust is a very deep skull. In the heart of every Israeli, even in the subconscious level, sure. Let let me have more kids. You know, I one generation after the Holocaust, people have just w one kid. If we need to get, if we need to, if we need to run away, just have one kid, and that's it. Uh, but on another level, I think, and I had a professor Gadi here. He, he Pro Professor Gadier from the Hebrew University, he wrote a book about the difference between the German science and the Israeli science, mm -hmm. and the difference between the German way of thinking and the Israeli or Jewish way, way of thinking. And in Israel, the culture itself, and I think that is, it is rooted in, in the Bible and in Judaism itself, because you cannot be a whole if you're not married, you cannot be a whole if you don't have kids. Uh, ben Gurion, the first prime minister in Israel, used to give a Ben Gurion prize for a mother with ten children. <laughs> so, in the first uh, uh, in the first days of this small country, the prime minister used to go to every mother with ten children, say, "You are getting a prize for the nation." In uh, like twenty years ago, the uh, the belly of you know the pregnant belly wasn't a private property of the woman. It was like a collective property that uh, people used to say, oh, this is a great, this is great. So it it became a collective thing. And it still is. People in Israel, you know, scientists that go to, to the postdoc and say, listen, I want to go, I, I want to get tenure, but I'm not giving up kids. And this is so profoundly different from the U.S. and Germany. You don't speak about kids in Germany. You don't speak about your kids in the U.S. You are in, in the U.S. and especially in Germany, you are either a scientist and dedicated to science or a family. And kids are like burden on your legs. And in Israel, this is exactly the opposite. Yeah, well, I, I hope that you're right, and I, I think that we can certainly learn something from 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 the Israelis. Um, I, I I believe in freedom. I believe that people should have as many families, uh, as many children as they want. Uh, what what the book is intended to do, there is a goal for the book. The book is meant to tell people: do not believe doomsayers who are telling you that the world has to necessarily end, because uh, huge chunks of the world's population. Uh, men and women, uh, parents are refusing to have children because they believe the world is going to end because we are going to run out of resources and that sort of thing. And what we are saying with this book is uh, you don't have to, don't believe that. Uh, it's okay to have kids. We are not cancer on the planet. To have a child is not an act of selfishness. Every baby born into the world is not just born with an empty stomach, but also with a brain capable of creating more value and uh, 
making the world a better place. Um, um, and, um, and and so that, that that's the that's the goal of the it's it's a very narrow sliver of the public debate that, that we want to impact. But obviously, we understand that this is just part of the broader picture. There are other things going on in the economy and in society which make our birth rates being uh, inferior to what they are in Israel. And I think that uh, it's it's very unfortunate. And so Israel is a great hope. Uh, to to us that we can, we can we can change this trajectory within the atmosphere or 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 within the framework of freedom, uh, obviously, uh, just as it is in Israel. Nobody's being forced to have children. You do it because you want to do it, and uh, I I hope that we can learn from you. You know, there was an article in Times Magazine, I think, three weeks ago, that suggesting women to mate with short guys in order to produce short babies because yeah, short the, babies the, yeah yeah it, it's it's uh, it's it's ridiculous. just ignore it these these are uh, i mean but look but look <laughs> it is people like that who create the zeitgeist who create the intellectual atmosphere in which people are making decisions about having children or not uh every week maybe every two weeks you can open a, usually a left wing newspaper New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, and whatever, where you have things like, is it still okay to have children? Is it, uh, you know, how much does a child of a CO2 does it produce? I don't give a damn how much how much how much CO2 the child will will consume mm -hmm. because, uh, or produce because that child could be the one child that is going to produce a way of getting the CO2 out of the uh, out of the atmosphere. Uh, but yes. On, on especially on the left of the political spectrum, you cannot open a newspaper without having journalists um, and intellectuals legitimizing the idea that we should basically die out. There, are, there is a school of thought um, originated by a South African of all places, South African intellectual called Benatar, that, that believes that we should all basically die out, that there shouldn't be any... Um, Rafael should, Benatar. Uh, I, I don't know his first name. Um, yeah. That... that um, there should be any conscious life in the world. And uh, I, I just think it's, I, I think it's insane because if the world matters, it only matters because we are there to perceive it with our senses. If we are not there to appreciate it with our sight, with our smell, with our touch, then who cares if the world exists? The animals don't care. The animals care about eating, having sex and not being eaten by other animals. <laughs> so, so I, I think that um, uh, we, we'll be fine so long as we can defeat this incredibly anti-human, anti-natalist uh, cult of death uh, that is spreading throughout the West uh, and that we are really combating on a daily basis. And, and again, this cult of death is strive for the pessimistic view of no purpose to life, no meaning. And maybe in Israeli, even the secular, has meaning. Once you have true meaning to life, you can't have this death cult like Raphael Benatar, like natalism, yes, which everything is more important than human beings. The Gaia is more important. The mm. idea of meaning in your life, of purpose, of something that is bigger than yourself, maybe, maybe talks, you know, maybe what you say, talk to people that say, yes, my life has meaning. And if my life has meaning, what you talk resonate well. But if my life is just a random chaos of atoms in the universe. We can do only so much. Um, okay. you know, the, the living in a free society allows people to the options. <laughs> Some of them have a lot of meaning in their lives. I have a lot of meaning in my life, so, so it appears that you do. Uh, other people don't know what to do with freedom. They don't understand uh, all the options they have. They don't understand how lucky they are to have all those options, and they don't create meaning. And uh, the, 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 the problem is, of course, that I, I'm, a, I'm a secular individual, but I understand that everybody's looking for transcendence, uh, transcendence. And the thing here is that with the decline of the traditional religions, it's not that people believe in nothing. It's that people believe in anything. And the green religion, Mother Gaia, the goddess Ma Gaia, has now filled the space that was emptied 
by the traditional religions, that was vacated by the traditional religions. So uh, in a sense, you could see, um, uh, yeah, th th that's where we are. Definitely, uh, definitely. Yeah. I will just add one thing that, you know, that the gay movement, the LGBT movement was, or, or we is, Uh, in in a nutshell for the destruction of the family unit but in Israel the gay community are fighting for making families for having babies and this is again something that is truly unique to Israel even the gay community in Israel want family want babies want to have baby this is something yeah. that is so profoundly inherent in the in the Israeli psyche that everyone wants baby Well, I, I would, I would, uh, I, I would simply, uh, I would urge you not to paint with too broad of a brush. Uh, in in the United States, um, we do have, of course, now uh, gay marriage, and a lot of gay people are having children. Of course, of course. Uh, so, so uh, like that. I mean, in any kind of a community or association, you will get crazy people. Uh, there, there is no question about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, I, I am. Uh, but 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 i also think that um a lot, a lot of gay people have an aspiration in the united states to have a family and have children which is which is obviously a, a great positive and i'm glad that's what's happening in israel as well yeah definitely marian tupi thank you so much for your time and for your insightful and eye opening book thank you so much you know i always ask my question my my i always ask my guests two questions uh, one You wrote this wonderful book, but can you recommend another book that you read in the last five or 10 years that truly changed the way you uh, perceive life or the world? Um, I, I think I, I, uh, I very much recommend uh, any book by Steven Pinker. Um, you know, Enlightenment, Enlightenment Now. Enlightenment Now. Very good book. The, uh, the Blank Slate. The blank slate and uh, the, the, he's oh, a great top -notch intellectual a colleague of mine uh johan norberg from sweden has written a wonderful book open which goes into greater depth than than we do in uh, superabundance about the importance of openness of society to new ideas and new experimentation so neighbor johan borgman because there is helmut neiborg which uh, no, no, no. which is norberg. an iq researcher yeah yeah N norberg johan norberg um no. He has a book out um, called Open. Uh, that, that, that's a very good book. Um, as I said, pretty much anything by Steven Pinker. Uh, great books by, um, by um, uh, Matt Ridley, Matthew Ridley. Oh, uh, this is, oh, he is great. The he Rational great. Optimist, uh, How yes. Innovation Works and, and, uh, and things like that. So, so that, that, that should hopefully get you started. This is a book by uh, your friend. How Collaboration and Curiosity Shape Humankind. Oh, yes. this is great. Yes, that's, okay. that's very good. Um, okay, this is great. And final, last question. Uh, as a very productive human being with this great book and so many other things that you do, can you give me just one productivity tip that works for you? That works for me. Um, I wake up <laughs> I was never asked this question before. Uh, identify times in your day when you are most productive and, and really work then. Um, one great thing about the, the silver lining of the COVID pandemic is that uh, we no longer have to work nine to five and be in the office, but we can stagger our day in a much more productivity conducing way. So what I do, I wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning uh, and I work till about noon Um, maybe like 11. Uh, then I go for a swim uh, and then I have lunch and uh, I, I, I work later, but I'm, I'm much more, much less productive in the afternoon. So, so I have identified in my life that I'm much more productive in the mornings and I like to do that. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, the world is quieter. I feel like I'm getting more out of, out of the day by, by starting, starting earlier. Um, and um Early start and a cup of coffee makes me happy and very productive. You know, I had last week I had Dan Pink on on the show, and he a few a few years ago he wrote a book called When the Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. And he said, we have larks and we have alls. We have like this morning people when we have the night people. And if you can recognize 
which type you are, you can yes. boost your creativity. And when you say you walk from five to 11, because this is extremely important for me, when you say walking, basically it is writing and researching. Well, I start every day by basically reading what is happening in the world. I spend about two to three hours looking not just about politics, but looking at what's happening in the economy. I look at what's happening in the tech world. Uh, I try to get a sense of where the new innovations are going to come from. So I spend most of the day morning uh, uh, reading. Uh, then, of course, I have to attend to emails and dealing with those, which is much less interesting, but you, <laughs> you still have to do that. And only then I really start thinking about my research uh, is after I've handled the, the bureaucratic responsibilities, but also uh, knowledge, getting a sense of what all those people that I follow have written, how they are thinking. And, and, and I, I think that information consumption is incredibly important um, uh, for one's productivity. But, but yes, uh, we should get away from the notion that everybody has to be in the office from nine to five. Not everybody is productive from nine to five. People want to take breaks uh, at uh, different times in a day to regenerate their batteries. Um, and, and, um, and I think that greater flexibility um, matters. Um, I, I, I would recommend that. Thank you so much. This was one hell of a conversation. Wow, I learned so much. And your book is ju just go and read his book uh, with Gabe Tupi. This is great. The, the, they... And you're just writing now a new book together, yes? Well, no, we, uh, next step, uh, we are going to be producing the Simon Abundance Index, which we produce every year, um, showing what happened to the time prices of 50 uh, most important commodities. As you know, they were becoming much more abundant until COVID, and then they became much more expensive. Um, but but now we are hoping to have better numbers this year. So that's the next step. Um, and... Uh, We'll see what the future holds. Hopefully a trip to Israel. So thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye.